So welcome back to our keynote session. So we have Professor uh, Vimla Patel with us. Uh, madam, can you hear us? You're on mute. OK, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can see you. It's fine. Oh, great. Thank you. So we have Professor Vimla El Patel, who is a professor adjunct of biomedical informatics at Columbia University in New York and the College of Health Solutions at Arizona State University in Arizona. She's also a senior research scientist and director of the Center for Cognitive Studies in Medical and Public Health at the New York Academy of Medicine, a graduate of McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Dr. Patel was a professor of medicine and psychology uh, and also director of McGill Cognitive Science Center from 2007 to 2009. She served as a professor and chair for biomedical informatics in the era of Newton School of Engineering at ASU. Her early research related to cognitive me mechanism, underlying expertise and medical decision making. Her studies over the past two decades are on decision supporting technology and errors in complex clinical environment, addressing the role of cognition in biomedical informatics and team decision for a safer clinical workplace. Professor Patel is an elected fellow of Royal Society of Canada the American College of Medical Informatics, and also the International Academy of Health Sciences Informatics. She is the editor of the Springer, uh, Springer book series on cognitive informatics in health and biomedicine. She is on the Journal of Intelligence-Based Medicine Editorial Board and the past associate the editor of Journal of Biomedical Informatics and assisted editor of Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. She has 350-plus scholarly publications, spanning books, and journals in biomedical informatics, education, clinical medicine, and cognitive science. So thank you, Professor Vimla, for being with us. And uh, 4 a.m. is too early for you, I understand. And thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation and being here with us today. Thank you very much. Can you hear me OK? Yes, uh, the voice is audible. It's perfect. OK, now you can I share have... your screen. In this new screen, how to do the screen share? There is an arrow next to the mic button. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> Share screen. Okay. Got it. A moment. So, okay. It just. Um... Okay. Okay, let's see. Oh, good. Okay. Right. Can you see okay? Yes, it's perfect. We can see. Right. Thank you. The Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so today, um, my talk is going to be on cognitive informatics in healthcare, promises and challenges. It's really an honor and a, and a great pleasure to be here, um, to be invited to give this talk and share some of my views uh, on um, and biomed cognitive informatics in healthcare and uh, the role of engineers and uh, decision scientists in uh, developing safer and more efficient and effective healthcare technologies and particularly products. The um, being as a cognitive um, scientist and more the cognitive psychologist, my focus is mostly on the human mind as it relates to the human brain. So you have a picture here, a figure of human brain, and um, and it's uh, it encompasses the kinds of uh, uh, neur neural uh, networks, neurons, and the networking, and together with the cognitive processes that relate to the brain, which is a part of the how mind processes information that we, we receive. So there are cognitive processes such as logic, problem solving, decision making, reasoning, 
um, perception, creativity, memory, language, learning, all of the things that are so important for us, for human beings, to be able to survive in this world and process information is harbored in our brain and mind. So it's a very close relationship between the neuroscience and the cognitive science, okay? So cognitive. Now, these processes are all very um, uh, invisible. If you ever wanted to study these processes, how people reason, how people solve problems, how people think about things, how people perceive, they are not visible to you by average eye. You have to have methods, a particular kind of methods that are research methods that can unpack these processes in human brain. And these this, the ability to study these, how people perceive information or reason as they work with technology, one of the biggest sciences that really informs us how to go about unpacking this is called cognitive science. Cognitive science is a, it's a science that involves uh, theories and methods from multiple domains. One is called linguistics, philosophy, neuroscience, uh, cognitive psychology, computer science, and cognitive anthropology. In other words, if you want to investigate how people um, make decisions about certain products as they interact with them, then you can borrow theories and methods from any one of these domains that you wanted. And these are very important. For example, linguistics becomes very important when you're starting to think about natural language processing. Philosophy becomes very important when you're talking about reasoning, human reasoning. And, and cognitive psychology, as you know, it's very important to the human basic, how people think, believe, perceive things. In computer science, you already know the impact of that in starting to understand the human brain and human mind. Now, this is very important. So invisible process and how we unpack this. Now, which really comes back to the point that this is an iceberg. If you look at what we really most often look at when we observe and do, do things, we look at the tip of the iceberg. What we don't look is what's underneath, all the explanations, all the things that go underneath below it that support the thing up top. And the whole issue of understanding cognition or human mind is really the underlying, what's underlying that supports it, what provides the explanation for what we observe, okay? And this is the main thing, this I study, that I have spent years studying and continue to do so to this day, because it's unpacking the human mind, which informs development of sophisticated, updated artificial intelligence technologies and other technologies that we use, particularly in healthcare, since I work in the healthcare domain. So what is cognitive informatics that we see? It's a very um, more modern term. It's um, an interdisciplinary field that comprises, as I already said, is cognitive and information sciences. And the focus is on human cognition mechanisms that are related underlying the processes and it also includes the design of interventional solutions often engineering and information technology related that can improve human activities this is a very important topic and i used to teach this topic for many many years and i continue to do so and most of my students happen to be from engineering and computer science departments and their first inclination is saying, I really want to build this app because I really am excited about it. I think I can build it. It's a more modern way to look at things. I want to build it. Okay, who's going to use it? Well, we're going to use it in the hospitals for the nurses to use in the intensive care units. Okay, have you ever been in the intensive care unit? No. Have you ever seen how nurses use the information? No. And so you can develop this app until you really have. So this is the this is why this is so important for them to understand why it's important to know. So the emerging new technologies advances in healthcare, there are two important issues to relate. One is to develop a successful and widely used healthcare products. Okay, they have to be successful, they have to deliver what you promise, and is widely used by people. And second, 
that these and and these products are useful only if knowledge engineering and human computer interaction domain methods are combined and shaped by contextual needs making sure that you're testing it in the application domain where it is being used and tested with real users because real users and, and artificial users are not exactly the same thing and i'll show you some examples second is data health my health related mining the health related data from large data sets using data mining techniques which is very popular and very important however it's important that data collected include a representative unbiased sample otherwise people don't trust you they are not representative of, of the population and doesn't always work isn't, isn't always successful and people also have lack of trust in the system and therefore you find that whatever health related solutions you come up with is very difficult to people to accept as we see very often in the um, in in the domain where we use um, uh, the, the COVID-19 right now it's a big issue people to accept that it's okay for you to use this vaccine but usually questions are i don't trust this thing because this data were not tested on my kind of people so this is a whole the whole issue that extends more than basic uh, human health care it's across all domains so um new methods what are the new methods in the digital age that we use particularly in the healthcare that i work in in the clinical domain in the hospitals and particularly with the uh, patients so using audit logs the digital trace what it really says is the moment you click on any system in the hospital clinics anywhere it leaves a digital trace behind so you can track back so if you suddenly have a uh, a mishap in the hospital for example somebody is really getting very sick or somebody died and you want to know whether what had happened exactly that this patient should not have died you want to backtrack the logs and audits which we do quite often and backtrack and say exactly what happened uh, when the medication was given by whom how the patient was managed and who were the people involved so digital trace is very important to be able to track this kind of data. Tracking health provider activities in clinical environment. You can use sensor-based technology, which is very, very sophisticated these days and getting better and better to the days when I started working on it, when there were clunky things and, uh, and half-life of the batteries were very low. Um, and using time motion tracking devices, look, time motion location tracking devices. These are very useful. I've been using them for quite some time. And the second one is using smartphones for easy automated access to healthcare in many communities. These are even in developing and uh, less developed countries. Um, everybody has a phone, a smartphone, even if they don't have enough food in the house. Therefore, one can leverage this to be able to do things that we want to do to be able to track data as long as they are secure. Uh, these are, after all, patient information, and they are also privacy concerns, usually. So let me walk through some examples of what I mean by that uh, in this. So one is to design electronic health systems, you know, and that um, catches the kind of activities of um, of um, clinicians in the hospital. Now, electronic health record system, every hospital these days in the US has it because it's required by law now because they can trace the data, they, all the data that you collect in the electronic health system, EHRs, go into a database in, the, in Washington where they are used for public health decision making. So it's very important that these electronic health records capture exactly what the doctors and the nurses do in the hospital. Unfortunately, most of these designs are done by people, uh, by engineers and, the, and the, the vendors who really have no knowledge of what, how it is being used in the hospital and where it is being used. So one, one methodology of computational ethnography is very common. 
it leverages automatic means of collecting data, reflecting of real users and unaltered behavior in real setting. I used to once walk around clinical in the hospital and collect data all by handheld writing in, in um, you know, very early in my years when I was just graduated. And for years I used to collect hand data or recorded. Sometime later on started to do a tape recording when the ethics committee will allow me. Now we don't have to do any of that. It leverages automatic means of doing it. And instead of what we call an ethnography in anthropology, we call it computational ethnography, which is, makes it so easy for us to collect data, which is wonderful. That does not mean that we have more accurate data or anything of that nature, but we do have more precise data, that's for sure. Now, based on the premise that user interaction with modern technologies always leave digital traces, as I said, and that are utilized to fully and partially reenact the activities. So that's what it's about. So here is the example of electronic health record system. And this is a system designed by uh, one of the vendors, a system designed to show the navigational flow uh, of the um, uh, of the particular, that how doctors are supposed to work in the clinic. And this is exactly how it was done, okay? And uh, this study shows that they, they introduced the electronic health, EHR, into the clinics to show, based on the notion that this is how it is supposed to be used and this is how doctors use. And doctors don't use it because it's supposed to be used in a particular way. They use it the way they do. So when you start to do this digital tracing with cognitive and computational ethnography, when you really look at it, what happens? Actual navigational flow by physician one, physician two, physician three, they're all different and they're nothing like what was designed. The day-to-day -day practice deviate from what they call the best practice or what you expect. This, these unintended ways they, they do this also means it diminishes the utility of the product. So you put the product out there and you expect it to be utilized fully, but it's not because it doesn't say anything about how these people work. So here is an opportunity to find out what they do and then you calibrate it for the user interface design. So you got a better design that aligns with the clinical workflow of the user model. You got to always remember that you are helping somebody to be able to uh, do their activities better. You want to augment human intelligence. So there's a mismatch between system design to support healthcare providers and the clinical activities here. So this shows that this kinds of methodology can capture these things that can be a real problem if the design is not properly done and introduced. So another example of tracking healthcare providers in hospital emergency rooms. Now, as you know, emergency rooms, have you ever been in one? And I'm sure most of us have sometime, it's overcrowded in, in the US, in in North America, it's always overcrowded. And I'm sure that what I know of a number of times that I had to visit an emergency room in India, and uh, it was really a nightmare. So overcrowding in hospital emergency rooms, that's really an issue. The whole idea is how do you reduce the time from the time patient arrives in the first scene by the doctor? So when patient arrives, we have to wait for a long, long time before doctor sees us or a nurse sees us or anybody sees us. By that time, you might even get better in the process. The second is what this is what we call door to doc time or door to doctor time. How can you reduce this time so that we can push the patients fast out the door and there's not so much overcrowding? Second is how do you reduce the doctor decision making time? By the time the doctor makes a decision what to do with the patient, whether they should be sent to intensive care unit, whether they should be sent home or just given medication to follow for a few days, whatever advice they're going to give the decision making is really called the um, decision making time. And then how do you reduce patient discharge time from the emergency room? In other words, once you've made the decision, Let's discharge the patient. They go to fill in some forms and they have to do things, but let's get them out of the door. 
all these things need to be evaluated. So how do we use modern technology, the tracking healthcare devices that these days are so available to us to be able to do this? Right now, when we look at this, they do by hand coding. They see how long it takes for a doctor to come into the hospital and in the emergency room and the first seeing the patients all hand coded. Now, these number of studies were done over the years in my lab, and uh, we did the automated workflow analysis and visualization, and also the, uh, we used what we call contextual computing, a Bluetooth-based approach for tracking. It's used the RFID technology, radio frequency identifier, or another one is called the Bluetooth. So what we have noticed now the sensor-based technology in biomedical informatics research has really changed. When I first started working with sensor-based technology, you see this in the green one on the left. This is how clunky the sensor was. We used to, pardon me, the, the tag was. And the tag was a clip-on and doctor used to carry on, on, on the lapel like that. And when we worked in the psychiatry emergency, patient used to freak out saying, who's tracking me? What are you doing with this? And the heart half life was very short. Every eight hours or nine hours, we had to go in the hospital, change the battery, put the battery in, and make sure they got, got the new uh, tag and wrote down who got the tag. Nowadays, we get this thin. The tags are so thin, they can put it in the pocket, and, you, and then they're all automatically tagged. So you come in the hospital, you go to the wall, and you see your name, you pull out a tag, it automatically records you that you have taken the tag, it sits in the pocket, and that you have signed on the system. So everything is signed on, everything automatic, electronic, you don't have to do anything. And they're thin, nobody can see it, nobody. and you can't sign out of the hospital anything until you have put the tag back. In the first case, in the earlier ones, studies we did, we had to track them, sometimes people forget to leave it. So things have changed a great deal, which made our studies over a period of time from 2008 to current studies use very different technology. We used to use this clunky big um, sensors in the, in the, when we use this green thing to sit in the hospital floor on the emergency floor and the intensive care unit. And uh, it was terrible, absolutely measurement was horrible. Now we use miniature sensors on the wall. They have tiny, tiny sensors that sit on the wall of the, this is a, in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, sit on the wall and we have to do the measurement to make sure how much area it covers and it tracks all the people keeping the, keeping the um, little um, sensors, little tags on their pockets and it tracks it around. After all the measurements we have done, that's what we do. And then of course we use this um, to monitor data who's interacting with whom, how often they're interacting, and what is the nature. What we don't know is what they are talking about when they're interacting, but we just have a sensor-based movement. But if we do this together with um, what they are talking about by audio recording, you not only have a movement, but you also have what is the nature of the interaction here. So this is the earlier studies we did with contextual computing. It's a Bluetooth-based tracking healthcare provider emergency. And Bluetooth was a very easy one to use, and it had a wide range, so it covered quite a large part of the emergency room. And we were interested in door-to-door -door time. How, how quickly can we, can we automate this so that we don't have to worry about, um, uh, you don't have to worry about recording anything. So we found that the time it took to um, see the doctors in each of this thing, a patient to see the doctor, and each of the samples of the subjects over a period of time, that the handwritten note and the time detected by the sensor was very close, which means you don't have to take your time away from the patient, or away from your task. You can automate everything if you just carry the tag and able to put the sensor. So you take the sensor, put it in your pocket, the tag, and the sensor will sense it how long it precisely. It's much more precise to do, and this can easily be done. So it was very, very useful to sensor base. So it was efficient, it was very effective, and also relatively safe. Now, we ran into some trouble. So the advantages is that trace locations of clinicians to predict potential clinical activity to improve care delivery. Okay, it's very efficient and effective. 
and you also have a potential for synchronizing this data, the data of how long it comes to see the patient, to the other kinds of data, the clinical data, the patient physiological data, audio data, other kinds of things. If they are not digitalized, you don't have that, that facility to do that. So you have all handwritten notes. The pitfalls are that door to dock time, the measurement precision, it's very hard. You don't know how much area it covers. And uh, sometimes it, it's um, covering the area that you're not supposed to cover and it captures other kinds of things that people worry about. Measurement of precisely door to dock time is not always uh, easy to determine. And that measurement is something that still needs to be fixed, but it's relatively good. It's relatively good, it's relatively better than handwritten. Door to decision making time is really troublesome. So the digital traces do not always match the reality of decision making practice. So what happens is the patient comes in and then first time the decision is made by the doctor. Okay, I'm going to send this patient home and this patient is to come into the, uh, to the uh, outpatient clinic in five days time. Now, then the doctor is called away to the other, um, other task because they're multitasking at all time. Now, decision making is not logged on the digital system until the doctor goes onto the system and says the decision is made. So decision is made a long time ago, but it only traces from the time you log into the system. So there is an imprecision here. It's not exactly the same. That creates a trouble. And also when patient leaves the room, finally to leave the hospital, it is not the time when all the forms are filled. It's time when the digital trace is given. So these are imprecise. So these needs to be worked on and these kinds of things because imprecision means that you have imprecise data that goes into a large database. It can have long-term implications. So third one I want to quickly go over is the, um, the use of smartphones in mental health in low to middle income countries. I've been working in, in a number of countries where, you know, which we know that depression and suicide risk is worldwide. Everybody, this is a concern. And with the current pandemic, it's an even bigger concern. So how can we capitalize on the smartphones to be able to track some of these people? And um, it's an efficient and easy to access to pertinent data of patients and is widely available. And the one we used was in South Pacific Islands. And uh, the wanted to find out quick as quickly the people who have who are at risk as early as possible for depression and suicide. We used a um, guideline which was already standardized and, and culturally sensitive and they had an automatic and had an algorithm of automatic score calculation, accurate score reflecting error free patient management. And um, the cognitive analysis show from this, this data that when we do a further analysis, that it's difficult to pass linguistic difficult phrases. These kinds of guidelines have a lot of difficult phrases. Culture favors quantity, people understand numbers, but translating quantity into quality and quality and quantity is real troublesome for people. So default, when they can't understand it, they use default use of intuition. And heuristics reduces the cognitive load. This intuitive heuristic, reduces the cognitive load, they don't have to think about it, they have to calculate, they just use intuition. So unless it's very clearly marked what you're measuring when you are assessing something, it's, it can be people who just fall back onto intuition. The, so this is the South Pacific Islands, we did the study, this is the major island, it's the major uh, thing is Fiji Islands, which is between Australia and New Zealand, so I'm here, and all the Pacific Islands are Samoa, Tonga, Cook Islands, French New, uh, Polynesia, New Caledonia, all that islands, and we did the studies in this region to see in the quite recent studies. And this is the suicide assessment rig for smartphone, an example, which shows that this is Estrada, we called it, and this is the guidelines, this is the put on the smartphone, which is all standardized, very carefully tested, and the guidelines with set of questions that nurses 
and doctors used to ask patients and patients and then collect digital data. And these were hand done by people who were using paper-based and digitally in smartphone, they give you a total score. And this score here will give you what to recommend. If the score is below 14, then the patient can do X. When the score is below over 14, then the patient has to do Y. So it's automatically done, it's much more precise and accurate and safe. So that really was a very successful study in those terms. And we also could do the usability, quick usability. It's a quick and dirty way, not the really um, a more detailed way of looking at usability that we do these days. So this was published in one of the Fijian newspapers that the Fiji government was very excited about doing this in part Pacific region. And it was, it, and which means we had a buy-in from the community. Now, however, we decided that we would look at exactly how do pay the, the doctors, in this case, the nurses, because we don't have enough doctors in the community. Most of the uh, low-income countries, uh, middle-income countries, don't always have available doctors. Nurses are trained. So here we trained community-based nurses to be able to use this app. So it was a training process. And they started to use this. So we wanted to know, did they really, how did they process this information? So we asked, so we recorded all this. For example, number one, this is the mental health nurse, number one, community nurse. Uh, she, the nurse asked the patient, do you enjoy life? And the patient said, not at all. And the nurse said, so it's most of the time. So I would score three. So the interviewer, which happened to be me, so you're saying that most of the time he enjoys based on the patient's answer? The nurse said, okay, let me ask the question again. Do you enjoy life? The patient said, not at, pardon me, not at all. The nurse said, that means never, pardon me, that means it's zero. Um, so this was inaccurate. The example number two, nurse number two said, nurse, do you feel you are just as good as other people? patient says, I have been feeling an unworthy as criminal most of the time. And the nurse said, oh, so that must be score three. I said, score three? And the nurse said, score three. So I said, so do you saying that the patient feels just as good as other people most of the time based on the answer? Oh, no, no, no. He does not feel good at all. So it must be a zero. So when you start to look at this kind of cognitive analysis, how they are processing that, there are a lot of errors. And these errors can compound over a period of time and depends on what kind of scales you're using, this can end up being, being pretty disastrous uh, for patient recommendation. But if the range is very wide, that certain uh, of recommendation, then little things like that will sneak up, uh, sneak in and you won't know about it. But little banks, little things make a big bang. So you've got to really concern about that. So what are my final thoughts on all these three examples? By the way, all these data, all these results are published. Every one of the studies I described, they're all published because I'm a stickler for publishing. Um, the final thoughts basically are, so this is what I want to leave you with, that it's very important to work with the latest technology, that we have sophisticated artificial intelligence, digitalized, um, technology available at our hands to be able to use wisely. So suitably developed, suitably is very important, develop and introduce advanced digital health technology, unite strengths of the people and machines. You can augment human instinct. That's what you want to do with smart algorithms that provide delivery of care that is not only efficient and effective, but you have to be safe. Understanding people their culture, their beliefs are so important in successful use of modern products. People aren't going to use it if, you, if it's not, it, it doesn't under, understand or capture their culture. There's a lot of stigma, for example, associated with mental health. You have to be able to understand what they are. Technology impacts the way we think. There's not just one way. It's, it's not just technology supports us, but impact the way we think, not only the way we do. So, collaborative, so what is really needed is collaborative efforts are needed between engineers, vendors, 
researchers with cognitive and social scientists and corresponding clinical communities and local people to develop usable and useful tools for better and safer delivery of healthcare. So we have to be able to work together, understand people, understand culture. And when you do a usability testing, not just a quick and dirty way, but actually understand how they use it, not what they think they, how they use it, but actually how they use it. Okay. So with that, I'm going to leave you and I really appreciate your time. And thank you very much for listening. And this is the last uh, paper we did together at AI in Medicine, Key Issues. Now and then, it's a long time ago, 2009, things have a lot of changed. But still, just to say the coming of artificial intelligence in machines and medicine. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Professor Vimla. I think it was a great presentation what you have given. So any questions from the audience here? Can I unmute Nishita? Unmute her. Yes, Nishita, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the wonderful uh, presentation. So, um, in these in this context, I would like to ask you that we always talk about uh, user centered design. So, what is exactly user centered design in the context of its HCI? So, is the user supposed to be involved? At uh, I mean, I would like to hear from you first. What is exactly user centered design? So, user centered design is exactly what it says. Um, so the um, when users, when users, the the center of the the investigation and studies and is really the user. In other words, it's exactly what I said. It's what the user's needs are. For example, if you want a user to use your product in a way, okay, then you want to know um, how, where is it going to be used, how they're going to be used, and is it going to fit into their lifestyle, for example? You know, they ask me to take my blood, pr blood pressure when I take my meals three times a day. Some countries, people don't eat three times a day, for example. So reason centered is what is what is what I do. And, and it is really together with the engineers. We've got to work very closely together to say, I want to use a product which is new in the market now. And I want to test it to make sure, or somebody's given me to test it. I would take that product, I will sit the product with a real user. Who's a real user? Say some notes. So using it. Okay, use it. I will put a set a camera. I will take the screenshots. I'll record everything as they're interacting with them, with the product. And they will talk aloud. They will talk aloud as they're doing it. I'm moving in this direction now. I want to click on this. And Oh, well, gee, it's not going there. I don't know why. Maybe I'll go back. But it's not, I don't know why it's not taking me back, for example. And you record everything and you can see the pitfalls, how they're having difficulty, not only in navigation, in the way they're thinking about things, or in visualization, maybe in the perception. So where are the pitfalls? And you fix that together before the next generation comes out. The user center is centered on the user who's actually using the system. Basically, it's, it's a it's really a very important factor to consider, and uh, it's a user-centered user AI design. It's called most importantly. I hope it helps. Oh uh, yeah. So that means uh, thank you for the uh, response. So if we in integrate the responses from the users at the stage of product design, and after the product is designed, let's say we get the user feedback and do an iterative version in order to incorporate whatever insights we get. So are we going to call it a user-centered design? If yes, we incorporate you are. You are. The thing is that you know, for the product designer, you want to make sure that it doesn't take too long from the first generation to second generation, you know, because you want to move forward. So you want to be able to do a quick turnaround. So you want to look at automatic ways of doing this, just quickly collecting the data, enable. You can start doing Researchers can do more detailed studies while you start putting in the uh, critical information in the next generation technology. So they can move on. It is user-centered design. As long as you're involving user, 
it is a user centered design absolutely okay okay and just one small point i mean one of the slides you mentioned that culture favors quantity to uh, quality what is meant by this point it means that sometimes what happens is people are unable to translate uh, numbers into into quality or our vice versa for example a study is done i did this study with mothers in india actually india um, in madurai down south and also in in montreal in canada the french canada and a number of other places so um, they went off the counter medication they picked up for a child the child had really severe cough and cold they pick up a medication to give your child the moment the child is given this they look at the label and said well if my if, if the, that I have to give so many milligrams or so many milliliters of medication for such a child. And they'll say, well, this number doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure I can understand this. And of course, if my child is half the size of what they're saying, maybe roughly I'll give half of those. So they use qualitative information to understand quantity. They use the intuition, a mother's intuition to do that. Now, they either overdose their children or underdose it. And so this is, and sometimes when you have qualitative information means you've got a lot of information and you have a whole paragraph. And from paragraph, you have to calculate how much. So they read through this thing and said, I really can't understand. I've got to process a lot of information. This is cognitive overload. And we're given a number and say, okay, now you go to, who's going to use this? So translation of quality into quantity, quantity to quality is not a trivial task. And it's called numeracy and literacy skills coming to the picture, but it is difficult and unless it is clear, precise, it's a problem. So uh, thank you, Professor Vimla, for being with us. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate yeah, it. a small token of thanks from our end. Virtually, we would like to thank you with this memento. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wonderful talk, Professor Vimla. It's okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so we'll be starting the next session in just one minute.